In this video, we look at a simplified summary of the story Star Horde Still Evades Treasure Hunters by Dean Ballinger, which appeared in the April 1980 issue of the magazine Treasure Search. In the midst of historians, there exists a difference of opinion when it comes to the Cherokee outlaw, Henry Starr. Some perceive him to be an infamous murderer, while others see him as a symbol of the oppressed noble savage, victimized by the tyranny of the white man. Regardless, he managed to conceal his share of spoils from over 24 bank robberies, which have never been found to this day. Known as the Last Bad Indian, Henry Starr was born in the year of 1873, near Fort Gibson in the territory of the five civilized tribes. His father was the notorious outlaw, George Hop Starr, and his grandfather was none other than Old Tom Starr, who operated a den for bandits in the Cherokee Nation. Henry Starr's brother was Sam Starr, who happened to be the brother-in-law of the notorious outlaw, Bell Starr. Initially, Henry attended an Indian school at Locust Grove for five years, before becoming a cowboy on the Open A Ranch situated near Nowata. He was quoted saying, I didn't want to be an outlaw like everybody else in my family. However, fate had other plans for him, as he was charged thrice for crimes he did not commit and lost his job as a result. His biggest adversary was Deputy Marshal Floyd Wilson, who held a deep-seated hatred for Indians. Although he wasn't certain whether Henry Starr actually committed those crimes, he believed that Henry was capable of doing so, owing to his family's notorious background. In the end, Henry was unable to secure another job. Once Deputy Wilson had branded him, Starr found that he was unable to find work. Though he had been released following his arrests due to his innocence, Starr was still seen as a bad person because of his brand. He was branded bad before he ever became bad, Oklahoma magistrate Floyd Kimbrough remarked. Desperate to earn a living, Starr confided in his friend Ed Newcomb. Since everybody thinks I'm a bad bully, he said, I might as well be one. Thus, they decided to rob the Missouri Pacific Depot at Nowata. On the evening of Friday, May 14, 1892, Starr and Newcomb rode into Nowata and tied their mounts at the rail in front of the depot. I don't know who was the most scared, depot agent Barney Hollenbeck said later, me or them, but they had the smoke end of their guns looking at me, so I said, boys, don't do anything you can be hung for. I'll get you the money. They then went on to rob the Shufelt and Sun General Store in Sequoia of $814 before spending the night in a haystack on the XU Ranch near Lenapa. The break of dawn revealed the figures riding away from the haystack on the XU Ranch, catching the attention of its owner, Albert Dodge. From the veranda of his house, he peered through his trusty telescope, unmasking the familiar face of Star. A sense of unease washed over Dodge, convinced that trouble brewed beneath the surface. Why would Star seek refuge in a haystack when he could have sought shelter in the bunkhouse? Dodge wasted no time in confirming his suspicions, swiftly mounting his horse and venturing into Sequoia. There, he sent a telegram to Deputy Marshal Floyd Wilson, disclosing Star's direction of escape. Wilson, fueled by the determination to finally apprehend Star, embarked on his pursuit without hesitation. It was at Wolf Creek where their paths converged. Star recalled later, he didn't give me an opportunity to surrender. He simply opened fire, and so did I. We both missed. His firearm jammed, but mine did not. I stood over him, witnessing his last moments, and uttered, Mr. Wilson, you have relentlessly pursued me for the final time. I felt no remorse as he succumbed. From that moment, Starr's fate was sealed. Branded a wanted man, he became both thief and murderer. I reckoned I had nothing to lose by continuing, he confessed in his memoirs. That marshal transformed me into an outlaw and a killer. Determined to forge his own path, Starr assembled a gang, knowing that the presence of accomplices couldn't intensify his punishment any further. They became known as the Wild Ones, leaving no stone unturned in their ventures. In the summer of 1893, the Wild Ones wrought havoc, robbing banks, railroad depots, stores, and even a train. From Muskogee to Kansas, their crimes were rampant, leaving behind a trail of destruction. But their numbers dwindled with each robbery, and by the time they hit Aldrich, Missouri, only Starr and John Wilson remained. 
Let's quit Robin and do a little hooraying, Star proposed to Wilson. But before they indulged in any revelry, Star had to stash his ill-gotten gains. He promised to meet Wilson in Colorado Springs after two weeks. I cashed my share of the money we had stolen, Star later recounted to a Hollywood producer. But naturally, I ain't saying where it is, except it's near the border in a place nobody could find in a million years. On January 6th, 1894, Star and Wilson reunited at the Antlers Hotel in Colorado Springs, but their freedom was short-lived. In the sweltering summer of 93, the Wild Ones were up to no good. With each robbery, their numbers dwindled until only Star and John Wilson remained after the Aldrich bank heist. Exhausted and rich, Star suggested they retire and celebrate their success, but fate had other plans. The next day, they were whooping some whiskey at the hotel's bar when a detective barged in with a double-barrel 10-gauge shotgun. Nobody dared to move. It remains a mystery how that detective tracked them down in Colorado Springs. Star's secret stash of loot was discovered, and they were taken back to Oklahoma in cuffs and leg irons. The infamous hanging judge Parker sentenced Wilson to 25 years for armed robbery. Star was sentenced to death for the murder of Marshall. The autumn of 1895 brought the second trial for Starr, who had been languishing in jail since his previous conviction. Despite his bleak circumstances, Starr found solace in his thoughts of the riches his crimes had earned him. However, the outcome of the trial was the same, a sentence of death by hanging. But once again, Starr's legal team managed to secure an appeal. Eventually, Starr was found guilty of manslaughter and robbery and sent to Ohio State Penitentiary in Columbus. During his time in prison, aided by newspaper writers Louis Stover and Oliver Combs, Starr told his life story, but each writer's version differed in important details. Nevertheless, Starr's sensational story captured the public's imagination. In 1902, the Cherokee Council petitioned President Theodore Roosevelt to pardon Starr and Roosevelt granted the pardon in June 1903. According to Starr's own account, he went to Kansas and took some money from his cash. In the quaint town of Tulsa, Starr settled down on a farm after tying the knot. He was determined to lead a life of honesty, but the world had other plans for him. An old robbery charge caught up with him and he was dragged to Arkansas. To hell with trying to be an honest person, he thought after his escape. His partner in crime, John Wilson, had just been released from prison, and together they robbed several banks. Wilson had enough cash to live an honest life and changed his name, but Starr wasn't so lucky. He was caught again and imprisoned until 1913. After his release, he teamed up with Louis Estes, and they robbed 14 banks in Oklahoma, filling Starr's coffers to the brim. In the spring of 1915, Starr's gang grew to six members, earning themselves the grand title of the great American bank robbers. However, they failed to live up to their lofty name. Their initial heist at the state bank in Stroud, Oklahoma was a calamity. During the chaos, a brave 17-year-old Paul Curry, armed with a hog-killing rifle from the neighboring butcher shop, managed to wound Starr. In retaliation, the bandits mercilessly shot and killed Curry before fleeing, leaving behind Starr and the bank's ill-gotten gains stuffed hastily into canvas sacks. This time, Starr found himself sentenced to four years in the Oklahoma State Penitentiary. In 1919, after his release on parole, he penned his memoirs for the Wichita Eagle and even portrayed himself in the motion picture, A Debtor to the Law. Historian Rivers, a fellow Cherokee, mused that had Starr retired after his cinematic portrayal, he might have become a legendary figure in American folklore, an emblem of injustice and an indomitable spirit. Yet, for reasons known only to Starr, he embarked on another audacious venture. With three companions and an automobile in place of trusty steeds, they journeyed to Harrison, Arkansas, setting their sights on the People's National Bank. With a commanding voice, Starr demanded, Hands up and not a sound! Unbeknownst to him, a customer named W.J. Myers had swiftly snatched a rifle discreetly kept by the bank. In a moment of sheer bravery, Myers shot Starr in the left flank. The other criminals fled, leaving the bank's spoils behind, and ultimately evaded capture. Starr's life flickered away two hours later, but not before uttering his final words. 
I am the wealthiest outlaw in the entire nation, and no one shall ever discover my hidden fortune. Despite the pleas of doctors, who desperately sought the location of his secret stash, Starr's response was a defiant and incomplete dismissal. He began to rebuff us, recalled Dr. Roy Struthers, but his breath left him before he could finish the sentence. If you're interested in purchasing a copy of this vintage magazine for yourself, or as a gift for a friend or loved one, please click the link in the description.